The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Hello learners, welcome to this revision lesson. I am Taso Jera, your economics teacher. We are going to be revising uh, this advanced level economics. We will be looking at revision phase two. In uh, our revision phase one, it was based on national economy, in which we saw nationals, national income, secular flow of income, money and banking, as well as public finance. So in this phase two, we are going to be looking at international economics and economic policies. Now, under these uh, international economics and economic policies, these are the topics we will dwell, we'll dwell on. International trade, economic growth and development, managing the economy, as well as population studies. Now, let's start with international trade. International trade is defined as the exchange of goods and services across international boundaries. And uh, we have two types. We have bilateral trade, which is the exchange of goods and services between two countries, as well as multilateral trade. That is the exchange of goods and services between more than two countries. Let's look at the reasons for international trade. We start with the desire for variety. Countries may engage in trade in order to permit the citizens enjoy goods that the domestic firms are unable to produce. That could be one of the reasons for international trade. That will lead to an increase in living standard. We have uneven distribution of natural resources. Natural resources in the world are not even distributed. They are distributed in such a way that there are some countries that have abundance of problems of mineral deposits, while others do not. So because of that, there is a need for trade between countries. Immobility of factors of production. Factors of production are highly immobile internationally, especially land, to a lesser extent, capital and level. And because of this, there is equally, that's one of the reasons why countries who have to engage or the trade with other countries because those commodities can only be produced where those factors are found. Differences in the level of technology is another factor or reason. Technology, there are some countries that do not have the technology of producing particular commodities. And so they can only consume such commodities if they import from other countries. Climatic differences is another reason. We have uh, different climatic conditions in the world that favor the cultivation of different crops. For instance, in the temperate, we easily have the cultivation of apples and probably bananas in the tropics. And because of this, there is a need for trade between countries to get goods that their climate is not permitted to cultivate. Finally, we we'll look at surplus production as a reason. It is possible that some countries, the domestic firms in the country, might produce goods that are more than 
domestic consumption. And because of that, it's going to force the local market out of the country. Let's look at um, theories of international trade. International trade theories. We're going to look at uh, two main theories. Absolute advantage and competitive. Before we get to the theories, there are assumptions that we're going to make. We're going to assume that um, only two countries um, exist. We we'll assume that only two commodities are produced. We we'll assume that there is constant return to steel. There are no transport costs, no barriers to trade, perfect mobility of factors of production. Now let's start with the theory of absolute advantage that was brought up by Adam Smith. Now, theory of absolute advantage, that is when a country can produce more of a commodity than another country using the same amount of resources. Meaning that a country is more efficient than the other country using the same amount of resources. In that case, that country is specialized in that commodity. We have uh, <coughs> David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. Uh, yeah, the country is specialized where they are able to sacrifice less than their trading partner. That is, when a country produces a commodity at a lower opportunity cost than another country using the same amount of resources. Now, this uh, theory actually forms the basis of international trade. It explains how, uh, even if a country has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods, there is, there could still be a reason for trade, provided uh, they have uh, different comparative advantages. We're going to look at the advantages of international trade. We'll start with the fact that it leads to an increase in the world output. Specialization will permit an increase in output of goods and services. That is one of the main reasons for international trade. It leads to an increase in output firms when countries tend to specialize in producing a particular community. Another advantage, another advantage is that it leads to wider markets for home produced goods. Domestic firms, domestic firms will be able to sell their goods, not only in the domestic, in the local market, they'll be able to get uh, sell to markets in other in markets in other areas, thanks to international trade. It leads to a greater variety of goods available to consumers. That means consumers at home will be able to consume even goods that, are on, that their local industries are unable to produce. That will lead to an increase in standards of living at home. Another point is that we're going to... Okay, competition from abroad encourages efficiency. That's the next point. Competition encourages efficiency. When countries um, when countries are trading, when they are competing with other countries, firms are competing with other firms in other countries, they are compelled to be efficient. And this efficiency could be translated by probably selling higher quality products at lower prices, thanks to international trade. It creates more employment opportunities, especially in the exporting countries. The exporting industry will have to employ citizens, thereby reducing unemployment. Finally, it leads to international peace and cooperation. Most often, countries will not want to enter into conflicts with their trading partners. They don't want to jeopardize their trade relations or trade links with other countries. And because of that, there is a uh, the country will be forced to maintain peace and cooperation. Now let's go to the disadvantage of international trade. We'll start with uh, the fact that it could lead to dumping. Dumping is simply this, uh, when if, uh, goods are sold cheaper in the foreign markets than at home. When this happens, the industry or the firm might tend to dominate in the foreign markets, and that will create a situation of uh, unemployment which will cause uh, probably uh, domestic firms to collapse. 
It would equally lead to unemployment and other related disadvantage. In the sense that if the infant industries at home are unable to compete favorably with the well established industries, when they fail to establish themselves very well to compete, they might collapse, thereby rendering their workers unemployed, and that will increase unemployment in the country. It will lead to harmful imports. That is, to lead to the consumption and importation, importation and consumption of harmful imports, harmful goods, such as dangerous weapons, uh, drugs, and so forth. That is a right advantage. Our dependency equally is a, is a problem. When countries specialize, they might tend to overdepend on other countries, and it becomes a problem <coughs> when they overdepend for a very a very vital commodity that a uh, commodity that is very necessary for the livelihood of the citizens. In that case, if there is any problem, any conflict with the trading partner, that country is going to suffer because they may have to stop the supply of uh, such commodity. Uh, it could equally lead to our production. Of course, the main advantage of specialization is that it leads to an increase in output. Now, when the output increases, and uh, let's assume that there's a fall in world demand for that commodity. We're going to have unsold stocks that will lead to our production. Finally, international rivalry would be another disadvantage. When countries, when countries are producing similar goods, they might tend to compete. And uh, there are times that the competition can be so intensive that it leads to jealousy. Because when one country is able to get a greater share of the market, it means the other country is losing the market. That will lead to rivalry among countries. Now let's look at the forms of restrictions on international trade. We'll start with tariffs. Tariffs are taxes that are levied on goods entering the country. They can either add valorem that is based on the price percentage of the price of the value of the imports, or specific, that is based on the volume or the quantity of the imports. We equally have uh, quotas. These are quantitative restrictions of goods entering a country. Close related to have an embargo, which is a complete ban of probably either ban of trade with a particular country or ban of goods with a particular country. Then, exchange control, that is, when the country limits the amount of foreign currency available to importers, that is going to restrict or is going to reduce the volume of uh, imports. Now, these are the main points. We have others like um, subsidies, uh, help, assistance that the government will give to domestic firms. That helps them to reduce their prices and make their goods competitive. We equally have um, administrative restrictions. We have voluntary export restraint, where two countries agree, the exporting countries agree to reduce the volume of exports to the other country. We have import deposit schemes and uh, other points. Now let's look at the effects of a tariff. Now we're going to look at this diagram. With this diagram, this price, EXM, it stands in a position where the country is not yet involved in international trade. TS represents domestic supply. DTL represents domestic demand. When a country is engaged in free international trade, uh, we are going to have this uh, WS, this supply curve that is perfectly elastic, and the price is going to be PY. Now, an imposition of a tariff will, lead, will cause the price to increase from PY to PT. So this other line represents world supply plus tariff. Now, let's look at the effects. We'll explain the effects of the tariff. Initially, with the world supply at PY, we saw that the consumption was represented by o OG because D is a domestic demand. So the consumption represented by OG G, while production represented by OC. That means GC, this gap, GC represents imports before tariffs are imposed. Now, when tariffs are imposed, 
to the price it rises from BY to BT. At this time, production increases from OC to OT. At the same time, consumption falls from OG to OF. Therefore, imports, imports are going to be represented by FT. This gap F, FT. This, yeah, FT now represents import. So in summary, what we are saying is that the effects of tariffs will be that the price of the commodity is going to rise, imports are going to reduce, production will be encouraged given that the price is increasing, consumption is going to be discouraged. Those are the main effects that we observe from this, uh, from this diagram. Let's look at the reasons for trade uh, protection. Why the government might want to protect trade. The first is to raise revenue. Tariffs are generally justified as um, a means to raise government revenue. So that could be uh, one of the main reasons for imposing tariffs is to raise revenue. We have protection of infant industries. Infant industries are newly established industries that are not yet strong to compete with giant industries producing at low cost abroad. So the government uh, will be obliged at times to protect this infant industry so that it could actually get mature well before they could uh, compete. So this protection will be done by imposing probably barriers on goods uh, from the giant industries whose entry in the country. Prevent dumping is another reason. Now dumping already had it as uh, selling goods cheaper abroad than at home. And we saw that dumping might not be very good because even though the goods are so cheaper, they might tend to uh, stabilize domestic firms not be able to produce and sell, and uh, the foreign firm might tend to dominate the market. So because of that, the government will have to impose barriers to prevent dumping. To correct an adverse balance of payments. An adverse balance of payment is a balance of payment deficit. And uh, one of the ways um, through which we have a balance of payment deficit to be when we turn to our imports and uh, export less, meaning that it's when uh, outflow of currency is more than inflow. So if the government tries to able to restrict the amount of imports, then that's going to help to solve the situation, prevent now more imports and less uh, outflow of currency. We talk of preventing harmful imports. Because of probably consumption, importation, and consumption of harmful imports, we already cited examples like dangerous weapons, drugs, the government might equally want to restrict trade. And we look at economic sanctions. Economic sanctions, at times, uh, trade barriers are imposed, they are imposed as sanctions to particular countries that do not want to cooperate with the international community. So, most often, the sanction will always be in terms of an embargo. Let's look at reasons against trade protection. Reasons against, against uh, trade protection will start with increase in prices. When um, tariffs are imposed, even as well as quotas, what happens is that the volume of imports get reduced. Because of that, prices are forced to rise. And that is the disadvantage. But at least one increase in domestic prices or imported price of imported goods. It encourages inefficiency among firms. When firms uh, know that there is no competition, they'll turn to gain monopoly power and it will produce low quality products in the absence of other uh, uh, goods from other firms in other countries. So firms might become inefficient with the lack of competition. So, what is bad about uh, protecting trade is that it gives monopoly parts to local industries and could cause them to become inefficient and produce low quality goods. Reduction in the volume of world trade. World trade will increase when countries turn to specialize uh, in the situation of free trade. When there is trade protection, countries now probably might force to try to produce almost all their needs, and that will they will not be able to benefit from the advantage of specialization. That will lead to a fall in the volume of world trade. It limits the consumption of a variety of goods. Consumers will be compelled 
probably to limit their consumption to what is available at home in the case of the restriction of particular imports. That's a reduction, and this means a reduction in living standards at home. Finally, it reduces the size of the market. The size of the market will be reduced. Probably domestic firms will not be able to sell in bigger markets out of the country. We're going to look at um, another concept, see on the international trade. Look at terms of trade. Terms of trade is uh, the rate at which a country's export exchange for its imports. It is usually calculated using this formula, the index of export prices divided by the index of import prices times 101. And when the value of, it's usually assume that the terms of trade is 100 in the base year. When the value of the terms of trade is greater than 100, it is said to be favorable. When it's less than 100, it is unfavorable. Equals 100 means that it just is balanced. Uh, the main cause of uh, the changes in the terms of trade will be a change in the demand and supply conditions of imports and exports. We talk about government taxes and subsidies. But it should be noted that when the prices of when export prices are rising and import prices are falling, that is equally regarded as a favorable movement in the balance of uh, trade. Unlike when export prices are falling, probably and the import prices are rising, it is an unfavorable movement in the terms of trade. Let's look at balance of payment. It is a record of the country's transactions with the rest of the world over a period of one year. Or we can say it represents the total receipts and payments of the country with the rest of the world within the period of the year. We're going to look at um, the accounts under the balance of payment. We'll start with the current account. It is an account that records payments and receipts on imports and exports of goods and services. Now, the current account is subdivided into visible trade balance, what we call balance of trade, which is the difference between the visible exports and visible imports. Visible items here we're talking about uh, in Cameroon cocoa, uh, cars, and so forth. While invisible trade balance is the difference between invisible exports and invisible imports. Now, invisible items, we'll talk about uh, services like uh, insurance, we have uh, banking services, shipping, we talk about transfers, we have government transfers, private transfers, we talk of uh, dividends, interest, profits, those will be under invisible, uh, invisible trade balance. That means you take the visible trade balance plus invisible, it gives you the current account balance. Let's go to another uh, account, the capital account, which is the difference between short-term and long-term capital inflows and outflows. Now, short-term capital movement will involve the movement of liquid assets between countries, like bank deposits. Uh, at times we describe that as hot money. While long-term capital movement will involve long-term lending and borrowing between countries, uh, investment uh, abroad or foreigners investing at home, that will be inflow, or portfolio investment as investing in shares, all that represents a long-term capital movement. We'll take inflows of capital minus outflows, it gives us a balance on the capital account. Then we look at the balancing item. It is uh, the net total of omissions and errors in the balance of payment account. When you carry out the statistics, when the value of the balance of uh, payment represents, or the accounts represent, or has a negative sign, it shows that there should sub this, uh, an item that was supposed to be subtracted. That was not. So it has to be subtracted. If it's positive, you are asked to act, to act, it means that you are expected to act. Now, when we add, when we add the, the current accounts, the capital accounts and the balance item, it gives us the total currency flow. We're going to come back to that. Let's go to the official financing account. This is an account that shows how 
the monetary authorities have dealt with the total currency flow. Actually, the total currency flow, which I earlier said, that is the combination of the current accounts, capital accounts, and the balance item. The total currency flow shows the balance of payment situation. It actually shows the actual balance of payment situation. When it is positive, it represents a surplus VOD. When it's negative, it shows the balance of payment deficit. And when it's zero, it means it's an equilibrium. room. So when it's negative, that's, or when it's negative or positive, the official finance account has to cap in. When it's negative, meaning that it's deficit, they have to, they have to finance the deficit, probably by borrowing from other countries, probably by running down their foreign reserves, and so forth. Then when it's positive, it means it's a surplus. The official financing account comes in to distribute the surplus, probably by giving out loans to other countries, increasing their foreign exchange reserves, and then so forth. Now let's go to the balance of payment deficit. It occurs when the total currency inflow is less than the total currency outflow. Or better still, outflow of currency is more than inflow. That's the balance of payment deficit. Now, when it's a persistent, the persistent balance of payment deficit has serious uh, negative effects or effects on the economy. Let's look at the consequences of the balance of payment deficit. It will cause a fall in domestic demand. Uh, the deficit will occur probably because we are importing more and uh, exporting less. It means our domestic demand or demand on domestic goods will fall, aggregate demand at home falls. That will that will lead to an increase in unemployment. That's um, a negative effect. It causes a welfare gain. When it's a deficit, it implies we are getting in more imports and selling uh, less, get, uh, se uh, selling our less exports. That means living standards has to do with uh, the quantity and quality of uh, consumer goods available. We are able to import more, then it increases welfare at home. That's what we say, it causes a welfare gain. This will increase in living standards. It may force a country to devalue its currency. That is another uh, effect or another consequence. A country has been compelled, especially with a persistent uh, balance of payment situation, may be compelled to devalue their currency, to reduce the, deliberately reduce the exchange value of their currency in relation to other currencies. That is done on a fixed exchange rate. When that is done, it makes export cheaper and uh, ex uh, imports uh, expensive. Let's look at short-term measures that can be used to correct the balance of payment deficit. We'll start with um, borrowing from IMF or other international institutions or even friendly countries. If that is done, then more inflow of currency will be able to correct and uh, uh, finance the deficit. Selling investment overseas. Um, any investment that Cameroonians or the government has out of the country, they could sell such investments that will permit an inflow of currency and equally it is going to lead to a probably it could lead to a correction in the BOP situation. Recalling foreign loans, any loans that we've given out the country could uh, call back the loans because they are in need, that will also help to cover the deficit. Uh, and finally, the country could use of their foreign exchange reserves, reserves in terms of foreign currency or gold. It could be used of equally to finance the deficit. Let's look at long-term measures that could equally be employed to correct the balance of payment deficits when it becomes persistent. We have import controls. The government could impose uh, import restrictions, probably using tariffs, quotas, embargoes. That will restrict the amount of goods entering the country and that will prevent more money being spent on uh, imports. Export promotion. The government might subsidize um, uh, industries, especially export oriented industries, so that they are able to produce uh, lower prices and that might lead to an increase in export. We look at contractional fiscal pol uh, measures and policies. The government could um, use uh, contractionary, or what we call uh, deflationary fiscal measures, such as 
increasing direct taxes and reducing government expenditure. That is going to lead to a reduction in aggregate demand. And when aggregate demand reduces, the amount of imports will surely be reduced. And that will correct the situation. Equally, the contractual monetary policy will uh, act in a similar manner. Contractual monetary policy here, we're thinking about um, probably increasing bank rates, calling for more special deposits and so forth. Um, selling securities in the open market, using funding. All that is going to reduce average demand, reduce uh, and finally reduce importation. The last result here, the public would actually devalue the currency, the devaluation, which um, is a deliberate reduction in the external value of the currency in terms of other currency under the fixed exchange rate. When that is done, uh, exports will be cheaper and the uh, imports will be, uh, will be expensive. So it tends to encourage exportation and discourages, discourages uh, importation. But it should be noted that it's only possible or only successful when the martial normal condition is fulfilled. That is, when the last of uh, export and imports are greater than one for the elastic. Now let's look at uh, the balance of payment subjects. It occurs when the total currency inflow is more than the total currency outflow. That's more money comes in than it goes out. A persistent balance of payment surplus is uh, a call for concern. That's where the consequences of a balance of payment surplus. It could be inflationary. When countries start to spend, to probably send out more goods and getting less, you end up having a situation where much money is just chasing fewer goods. That could be inflationary. It could lead to a fall in domestic living standards. Living standards uh, depend on the quantity of and quality of uh, goods available to consumers, or to the household. When more of such goods are sent out, it means less are available at home, thereby reducing domestic living standards. Uh, we, could at, we could equally say it may lead to currency appreciation. Now, the currency appreciates, appreciation that is uh, an increase in the external value of the currency under the floating exchange rate system. When the currency appreciates, what is going to happen is that it makes uh, our export now look expensive and it turns to discourage, it makes export less competitive, it turns to discourage exportation. Let's look at short term measures to correct a balance of payments, of course. We'll start with um, increasing the country's foreign exchange reserves. Foreign exchange reserves should be increased. If that is done, then because the idea of correcting a surplus, a surplus, you need to distribute uh, uh, the surplus so as to get a balanced situation. So an increase in the foreign exchange reserve is going to do that. Equally, the government could purchase foreign uh, investments, investment and product to buy private industries, buy shares, to follow investment, buy shares in other countries. That might cause an outflow of currency and it could uh, correct balance of payment surplus. Uh, repaying loans to foreign institutions or probably friendly countries. So, if the government is going to any country or institutions, it's the best time for them to repay the loans. That could help to also take care of the situation. It also could be given to countries that are in need, probably countries that have, been, they are, they have some natural, they are, they are facing some natural calamities, earthquakes, and so forth. Country could give aid, that would also help. But let's go to long term measures <coughs> that are used to correct the BOP surplus. We'll start with expansionary fiscal uh, policy. An expansionary fiscal policy will entail reducing private direct taxes and increasing government expenditure. When this is done, what happens is that it increases aggregate demand. When aggregate demand increases, it means that people are going to be motivated to buy a demand. There's an increase in the demand for imports. When imports increase, more money goes out and the surplus is going to be uh, taken care of. Um, expansionary monetary policy equally will do uh, the same. That is, when the government probably turns to buy securities in the open market, government will turn to reduce uh, uh, bank minimum lending rates. All that will lead to an increase in average demand 
and that will lead to an increase in importation and more outflow of currency. Reduce or abolish import controls. The government abolish or removes all restrictions on imports. That means more goods are going to enter at cheaper prices and uh, the country will be encouraged to import more. That will lead to an outflow of currency. The last option is uh, the government would revalue the currency revaluation. Revaluation is simply an increase, a deliberate increase, official deliberate increase in the external value of the currency in terms of another currency under the fixed exchange rate. Now, when the currency is devalued, uh, the main uh, effect is that it makes it causes uh, exports uh, expensive. It makes exports expensive and import cheaper, thereby encouraging uh, importation and discouraging exportation. Uh, however, this is uh, it's only successful also when the demand for export and imports are both elastic. Now let's uh, look at devaluation a little bit more detailly. We have seen devaluation before. It is a deliberate reduction in the exchange rate of the, of the currency. And all, uh, uh, earlier I said, when this happens, it uh, increases exportation because it has, uh, uh, it reduces the, the prices of exports and increases Price of imports. But for devaluation to be successful, there are certain conditions that must be fulfilled. Uh, let's start with the demand for exports must be elastic. Demand for exports must be elastic. Because devaluation makes export cheaper. If the demand for export is inelastic, the devaluation is not going to be successful. When it's cheap, when it's uh, elastic, it means that when the price of the commodity is elastic falls, more of it is going to be demanded, more foreign revenue is going to be earned, and that is going to lead to an inflow of currency and to a correction of the balance of payment situation. Another point is that the demand for imports should be elastic. Devaluation, remember, it makes imports uh, 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 expensive. It makes import expensive. Now, if imports were to be inelastic in demand, even if they are expensive, people will still want to import those two uh, imports, and the expansion of import is going to be high. So, for it to be successful, the demand for import should be elastic, so that so that when the price increases, it's going to discourage people from consuming uh, imports. So, it's going to reduce the expansion of imports. The supply of exports should be elastic. That's another point. Uh, it is, uh, we already said, devaluation will cause a fall in export prices. That means it is going to lead to an increase in demand, everything being equal, increase in demand for exports. But the demand for exports, uh, an increase in demand of exports should, they should equal that increase in supply. So if the country is unable to supply, to increase supply, they don't have any existing any spare capacity to increase supply, then Devaluation is not going to be successful. If supply becomes inelastic, if they cannot respond to increase in demand, then there is going to be a problem. So it should only be successful when there is some spare capacity and every the country should be able to increase production and increase uh, uh, supply in response to the increase in demand. Finally, there should be no retaliation. Trading partners should not equally revalue their currency. If not, it's going to be of no use. Now let's look at the j curve effect. It is the worsening of the BOP situation after devaluation before a gradual improvement into a surplus. Meaning that when there's devaluation, what happens is that this balance of payment situation gets worse off for some short time before it gradually improves into a surplus. Now let's look at the diagram. There's the diagram. We'll see that, let's assume that um, you have the negative side here has it shows that it is a, it's a deficit, and this other positive side is a BOP surplus. Now let's assume that there's um, the BOP situation is at point A, where is the deficit, and at that point A, the government decides to devalue the currency. What is going to happen is that things are going to get bad instead initially, and you move from A and goes right down to B. Now, one of the reasons why this could occur would be because um, the 
the country might not be able to respond immediately, probably might be due to the immobility of factors to respond to increased probably supply in response to the increase in demand. Or it might be because in the short run, consumers might need to look for close substitutes. They might still consume the similar commodities, thereby increasing expenditure on them on imports. So, but after some time, they will now gradually move into a surplus. This is described as a J-curve effect. Now, let's look at um, uh, exchange rates. What type of exchange rate is simply the price of a currency in terms of a normal currency, which is really determined in the foreign exchange market. Um, we're going to start, there are three main exchange rates that we're going to be looking at. We'll start with the floating exchange rate. This is a system where the exchange rate is determined by the forces of demand and supply of the currency without any official interference, meaning that the government is not uh, inter uh, intervening. Now let's take uh, let's look at this diagram. If we look at this diagram, we'll see we're looking at the exchange rates of uh, we have the quantity of francs in terms of dollars. This represents the supply, francs CFA, this represents the demand of francs CFA. Now, where the two curves intersect, that's the equilibrium exchange rate. It means that one uh, franc CFA equals 0 0.001666 uh, US dollar. In effect, you have to convert it, it means you take uh, uh, one divided by this, it should give us about 600 francs CFA equals one US dollar. That is the exchange rate that is assumed here. So this exchange rate is determined by the forces of demand and supply without any official interference. Let's look at advantages of a freely floating exchange rate. We'll start with uh, the fact that it provides an automatic adjustment to balance of payment equilibrium. Automatic adjustment to balance of payment equilibrium. Let's assume that the disequilibrium could be a balance of payment deficit. The deficit usually occurs when um, we tend to import more and we export less. When we are importing more, what is happening is that there's an increase in the supply of CFA or supply of a currency in the foreign uh, exchange market. And when the supply of the currency increases, what is going to happen? The value, the exchange rate falls. The supply of anything increases, the, the price falls, the exchange rate falls. That means it tends to, the currency tends to depreciate. And when the currency depreciates, the effect is that it makes now our export cheaper and encourages exportation. It permit us to earn more foreign uh, uh, more income from exports. That is um, that means it automatically corrects the BOP situation. If there is equilibrium uh, where a surplus, a surplus BOP where we are probably exporting more than importing, an increase in exports means an increase in the demand for our currency because foreigners who buy our goods and need our currency, it needs an increase in the demand for our currency. And when the demand for our currency increases, it forces the exchange rate to appreciate. And when the exchange rate appreciates, it makes export less competitive. It tends to discourage exportation and encourages uh, importation. That will lead to an automatic adjustment of the balance of payment. Now let's look at uh, the next point, efficient allocation of world resources. When the forces of demand and supply are given the chance to operate freely, world resources, the resources between, um, between countries will always be efficiently allocated than a situation where there is some intervention. So world resources will be more better allocated when we are talking about the free force of demand and supply. Next point, government has a greater freedom to pursue domestic goals. Now, it means government can allow, since the equilibrium can be, it can be adjusted automatically, since the position the BOP can be adjusted automatically, the exchange rate can be adjusted automatically, it means the government might be concerned with other objectives, other goals, probably taking care of unemployment, taking care of trying to achieve a steady rate of economic growth, rather than bothering about the exchange rate. So it permits to give the government more freedom to pursue other domestic goals. Finally, we could say there are greater economies in the use of foreign exchange reserves. Under the floating exchange rate uh, system, the government does not need to stockpile foreign reserves like it is done under the fixed exchange in order to buy and sell securities and maintain the exchange rate. So those reserves 
can now be used for other more productive uh, uh, reasons. Now let's go to the disadvantages. Disadvantage of a freely floating exchange rate. We'll start with uh, the fact that there is uncertainty. The constant fluctuations in the price or the exchange rates due to the force of demand and supply leads to uncertainty. It actually makes planning very difficult in international trade. It makes export exporters become uncertain. They are not aware, they cannot be aware in advance what they are going to earn or what they will spend in uh, their trade transactions. They fall in the level of investment, especially foreign inve investment. Foreign investors, especially, may easily be discouraged with the constant fluctuations in the exchange rate, and they might not want to engage in a country where they are not sure of the exchange rate. It encourages speculative activities which may be destabilizing. Speculators are those who buy a currency when it's uh, on the lower exchange rate, hoping to sell in the future when the price must have risen in right to make some capital gain. The activity of these uh, uh, speculators at times tends to further destabilize the rates, the exchange rate. We're going to see how the activities destabilize, destabilize uh, the exchange rate and uh, to an extent, we equally look at how they can stabilize the exchange rate. Now, let's look at how speculators stabilize the exchange rate. Okay, looking at this diagram, we'll see that um, with the presence of speculators, we have a black, uh, black line, speculators, with us, speculators, we have the red. So, you see that, um, let's assume that the rate of the exchange rate is high. When the exchange rate is very high, what happens is that speculators will rush into the market in order to, to sell whatever they have. When they rush to sell, what happens is they will tend to increase the supply of the currency. When the supply of the currency increases, it reduces the exchange rate. The exchange rate will not rise, will not rise as much as it would have risen. So it tends to reduce the amplitude of fluctuation. On the other hand, when there is a very low, when the exchange rate is very low, speculators will enter in order to buy the currency. To enter to buy the currency so as to sell in the future and make some profit. Now, when they are buying the currency, what is happening is that there is an increase in demand. They are forcing the demand now to increase of the currency. And when it's more the currency increases, it makes now the price of the currency or the exchange rate not to fall as low as it would have fallen thanks to the activities of speculators. So their intervention tries to reduce the amplitude of fluctuation in the exchange rate. Let's look at a situation where they will destabilize the exchange rate. Now, when speculators expect the exchange rate to fall, or let's say expect it to rise, even if it has no reason, what they will do is that they will rush into the market in order to buy, so that they will now sell when it must have risen at a very high level. When they rush to buy, what is happening? They, they will force the exchange rate to increase because this red line shows uh, with speculators. They will force the exchange rate to further rise more than it would have risen because they are rushed to buy in order to sell uh, in future. On the other hand, when they expect the rates to fall, even if they have not yet fallen, they are going to rush to the market to sell whatever they have so as to make their profit before the rate falls. So when they rush to sell, they will tend to increase the supply of the commodity. When the supply increases, it forces the price to fall lower than it would have fallen in the case where speculators were not present. So in this case, we see how the influence or the intervention of speculators help to further destabilize the exchange rate. Now let's go to the fixed exchange rate. We just finished the floating exchange or free floating exchange. The fixed exchange rate it is the one in which <clears throat> the price of a currency in terms of another is fixed by the government. Uh, we actually we have there is a fixed exchange rate between the franc CFA and the euro, which is 655.957 franc CFA equals one euro. That's a fixed it is it's, uh, set by the government. In the past, we used to have the gold standard. After some time, the government spent their currency in relation to 
uh, currency or dominant uh, dominant currency, what they call key currencies. Now let's look at the advantages of the fixed exchange rate. The first is that it eliminates uncertainty associated with floating rates. We already saw how uh, uncertainty with the floating exchange rate will tend to discourage uh, private investors and so forth. So they, there, there is certainty when we're operating a fixed exchange rate. Everybody is aware of the exchange rate. Importers are aware, the exporters, all of them are, they are aware of their expenditure, what they're going to spend, what they'll earn as income in advance. So it eliminates uncertainty. Equally, it eliminates speculative activities. Speculators are absent in this market, given that the price is fixed by the government. So their destabilizing effect will not be there. It imposes discipline on countries. Countries will be forced to work together in order to maintain that particular, that official parity for a long, a longer time. So countries are forced to be, to be disciplined. Finally, there is no fear of currency depreciation or appreciation. Depreciation or appreciation occurs because of a constant fluctuation, either increase in demand, supply, and so forth. So when the government is there to intervene, there will be no fear of currency appreciation or depreciation or fluctuation in the currency. Now, let's look at the disadvantages of a fixed exchange rate. The fixed exchange rate is expensive to maintain, very expensive. The government needs to uh, have official use, official reserves in order to buy, have to, 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 to buy or sell when it's going above the rates and when it's threatening it to go up and uh, buy that's buy when it's going below, sell when it's going up in order to maintain the rate. So it's expensive. For the government because they have to stockpile official reserve in order to control that. Uh, it relates to inefficient allocation of world resources. Since the force of demand and supply are not allowed to freely uh, allocate resources from one country to another, this will lead to a distortion in the allocation of world resources. We could um, equally say that the adjustment mechanism is very slow under the fixed exchange rate. Now, the adjustment mechanism, under the fixed exchange rate, uh, the government might need to intervene at one time to probably devalue the currency or revalue the currency, and these uh, measures will actually take a very long time. They take a long time, so the adjustment mechanism in this uh, exchange rate is very slow. Now, let's go to the last, the managed exchange rate. Now, this exists when the government occasionally intervenes in the exchange market to stabilize the exchange rate. Meaning that the government allows the exchange rate to fluctuate within a given range, given limit. They only, she only intervenes when it's going beyond the limit. Let's look at this diagram to explain that. Let's assume that there is a, the upper limit here, an assumption, quantity of dollars in terms of saving. Upper limit here would be one dollar in terms of uh, that six hundred francs safety, one dollar. The lower limit, one dollar equals five hundred francs safety. Meaning that if it's fluctuating within this range, the government is not going to intervene. As long as when it goes above, the government intervenes. That government intervenes now to sell the commodity, sell the currency, so that the price, the exchange rate should fall. On the other hand, when it's going below, the government intervenes to buy. They use foreign currency to buy in order to increase. The exchange rate. We we'll look at international economic institutions. We we'll start with the World Bank, or what is called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. It was created um, to provide long-term financial assistance to member countries. Remember, it was created immediately after the immediately after the Second World War to provide long-term financial assistance to member countries. Equally, the, the sister organization uh, is the International Monetary Fund, which equally is a Britain with um, institution like the World Bank. That was created to ensure the stability of the international monetary system for sustainable economic growth and rising living standards. They actually, the International Monetary Fund 
The uh, other functions are to facilitate international liquidity. They are to help countries suffering from dollars of payment problems and other uh, uh, objectives. Now, let's look at the World Trade Organization. It is the only international organization dealing with the global rules of trade between nations. That is a, it's an organization that the main objective is to make sure that trade, that there's free trade, trade is as free as possible with less discrimination. It actually came to replace GATS, that's the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Let's look at trade blocks. Which, um, a trade block is a group of countries that trade together and benefit from some economic advantages. We're going to classify the trade blocks, starting with the lowest, free trade area. Free trade area is an association of member countries that eliminate tariff barriers among members, but allow each member to decide on tar the tariff to charge on non-members. And then we have um, we have a customs union. Customs union also is an association of member countries. It's similar to free trade, but a little bit. Association of member countries that uh, equally eliminate tariff barriers among members, but they jointly decide on the amount of tariff to charge on non-members. Then we have a common market. A common market is a common is a, a customs union that, in addition to free movement of goods and services, there is free movement of labor and capital. Then economic union. Economic union is uh, a common market that members have common economic policies, like common policies in agriculture, transport, and so forth. Now we'll go to a different uh, <coughs> topic: economic growth. Economic growth is um, regarded as a sustained increase in the productive capacity of the country. But actually, we're going to look at actual the uh, two types: actual and potential. Actual growth is a rise in the amount of goods and services provided, an increase in the amount of goods and services provided, it's usually measured based on an increase in the real GDP. While potential growth is seen as an increase in the ability of the country to produce goods and services, uh, it's usually measured when there's an outward shift of the PPC, potential growth. Now, economic development, it is an increase in the real income of an economy accompanied by an equitable distribution and structural transformation. That is, when the country achieves economic uh, growth and it is accompanied by an increase in living standards, we can now talk of economic development. Let's look at some causes of economic growth. We'll start with population growth. An increase in population is going to cause an increase in demand, the market will increase, as well as there's cheap labor, there's more labor force. Technical progress, an increase in uh, or better uh, improved machines, better method of production. This will increase productivity and that will increase output. We talk about reallocation of resources. When resources are reallocated from probably declining industries to expanding industries, or let's say for consumer group industry, capital group industries, that will lead to growth. Political stability will encourage growth, will encourage investors to invest, or instability will discourage uh, investment. Education and training, we talk about human capital, uh, human investment here. Is that if, when people become skilled, when they are more productive, then they are going to, their output is going to increase, and that will increase, uh, will lead to economic growth. We equally have the discovery and uh, exploitation of natural resources. When the resources are discovered and they are actually effectively exploited, that is also going to lead to growth. Let's look at the benefits of growth. We we'll start with increasing government revenue, tax revenue. Government tax revenue is going to automatically increase without the government increasing our tax rates. Since many persons who have us with many economic activities, there are more incomes available. That will increase uh, the tax base. Increase in standards of living. More goods and services are going to be available, and that will mean an increase in living standards. More job opportunities. There's growth, there are more economic activities, more job opportunities. 
unemployment is going to reduce. If people alleviate poverty, when there is a growth, more in incomes will increase and poverty is going to be alleviated. Uh, it attaches a great deal of political prestige to a country. Economic growth gives a country some prestige at an international level, increases their status, especially in international government. A reduction in the burden of the national debt. The uh, economic growth makes the burden of the national debt lighter. In, in, uh, the, the, the government could easily take care of, the, of debt when they have a faster rate of economic growth. Now let's look at the disadvantages of economic growth. We we'll start with uh, increase in negative externalities. When there is growth, we have uh, there is uh, an increase in probably cars, pollution, we we'll have congestion, and uh, the industries will have to increase their their pollution, increase in their air pollution, water pollution. That is another disadvantage. Technological unemployment might result because of an introduction of labor saving machinery or the mechanization of the production process. They could, they, there is going to be sacrifice. One of the main costs of economic growth is sacrifice of current living standards. Given that we are not present, we are trying now to divert resources from consumer goods, production to producer goods, current living standards will have to be sacrificed. It could cause demand pool inflation with less availability of consumer goods. Demand might be more than supply. Over exploitation of natural resources, especially non renewable resources, which will, there will be a problem for the future generation. Environmental degradation will be another cost. There is um, the extraction of, of mechanized farming or industries might need to be destruction, lead to the destruction of the attractive of the natural scenery, the natural beauty of the environment. Now, we'll go to another uh, topic, which is managing the economy. Under this, there are many subtopics, and we'll start with the trade cycle, which is just a periodic fluctuation in economic activity. There are four phases that we're going to examine here. We'll start with the boom, the phase where economic activities are flourishing. Employment is high, prices are high, profit level is high. We'll go to the recession, or what we call a downturn, a contraction. Economic activity starts to slow down, unemployment starts rising, prices start falling. Look at the depression of Islam, where you have a low level of aggregate demand, high unemployment. And then finally, we have a recovery, where business activities start to pick up again. Recovery. That's we can talk, talk about an expansion in the economy. This is a diagram explaining that. We have a boom here at this top. Then we have a recession. Things are getting but goes from right to depression with strong, high uh, level of unemployment. Then the recovery things start getting better, it gets to a boom, and so forth. We have this, uh, this line here is a the trend growth, uh, growth path of time and economic activity. Instruments of government economic policy. We're going to look at um, some few main, some main uh, policies to start with fiscal policy which is deliberate manipulation of government income and expenditure to influence the level of economic activity. And uh, the main instrument of the fiscal policy is the budget. Budget, we talk about budget support, deficits, or balance. We we'll have the monetary policy, which is a deliberate change in the supply of money to influence the aggregate demand in the economy. Now, the main instruments here have uh, bank rates, minimum lending rates, full market operations, funding, moral situation, and uh, Others. Regional policy is a policy through which the government helps influence the location of industries so as to ensure greater efficiency and output. So, the policy that the government uses to make sure that regions are, uh, there is a problem regional balance, to make sure that the, some regions are not overdeveloped and others less developed. Now, let's look at um, government economic policy objectives, so better see macro. Economic objectives. We'll start with uh, achieving full employment. One of the objectives of the government is to make sure that everyone is, uh, who is willing and able to work is able to get a job. Equally, the government is out to maintain stable prices, avoid so that it should be constant inflation, deflation, prices should be stable in the market. That's another objective of the government. 
to ensure an acceptable rate of economic growth. That's one of the most um, important objectives of most governments, to ensure a steady rate of economic growth. We have ensured a more equitable distribution of income to be done through using progressive taxes, rather providing public goods that have to narrow uh, the gap between the poor and the rich. Finally, balance regional development, making sure all regions, uh, everybody in each region is uh, able to have access to probably basic necessities. Now, let's go to unemployment, another soft of under managing the economy. Unemployment is the number of people who are qualified and willing to work at the current levels of wage rates, but cannot find jobs. So we have uh, the, the rate of unemployment here is calculated as the number of unemployed on the level force times 100 on one. Types of unemployment, we have the structural unemployment, which is permanent for the demand of the commodity of, the, of an industry that will force the industry to reduce the number of uh, workers. Seasonal unemployment, which could be due to seasonal or to climatic changes. Seasonal unemployment, which could be caused by immobility of labor or ignorance of available job opportunities elsewhere. Seasonal unemployment, that is uh, when there's a general decline in aggregate demand, it will cause general usually during a depression in the trade cycle. Technological unemployment, which could be due to introduction or mechanization of the production process. We have disguised unemployment or underemployment, that's underutilization of labor in the production process. Then we have residual unemployment, that is due to fiscal handicap. Then let's go to the effects of unemployment. We have a decline or a fall or a loss in output for unemployment. Why we're supposed to be doing the output is lost. There's a fall in government revenue. The government will have to let revenue from taxes. The government will not be able to get that from the unemployed. There's an increase in government expenditure. She might need to spend more to provide unemployment benefits, to provide the training schemes to the unemployed. There's a fall in living standards, especially for the unemployed. There is a high crime rate, prostitution will increase due to unemployment. There's an increased burden on the working population. Those working will need to take care of themselves and equally of the unemployed. Population studies, referring to smaller study, population studies uh, will start with population census, which is an official and periodic counting of the number of people living in a particular area at a particular time. Then we we'll look at um, theories of population. We we'll start with the Malthusian theory. Which is described as a pessimist theory, the theory of Robert, Tom, uh, Robert Thomas Malthus, uh, the clergyman who was the first economist to write on population. He observed the population of Britain as increasing faster than the rate of food production. He described the rate as a geometric increase, and food production he called it uh, an arithmetic increase. And he wondered if nothing was done, it would lead to misery and vice. He proposed preventive checks, which were those things that could retard the population from increasing life. Uh, late marriages, celibacy, uh, family planning, and he equally says if countries do not impose these preventive checks, nature will provide positive checks through wars, natural calamities, and so forth. We have a, uh, a counter theory of Esther uh, uh, population theory, that's an optimistic. Esther uh, the Danish geographer, according to her, population growth is. Um, is good. An increase in population to have this one increase in a uh, uh, primary technology, which an increase in labor force, increase in market size, and more food production is necessary to be available. So she was optimistic, while Marthos was uh, pessimistic. Alright, by changes in population, we're going to have um, changes in population can either be an increase in population or a decrease. Now, a change in population occurs through two ways. Natural increase or migration. Natural increase to have movement in birds and death rates, and uh, migration, we talk about immigration and uh, emigration. Now, we're going to look at birth rates, the number of live births per thousand of the population a year. This is a formula number of births of total population times 100 times 1,000. School birth rates, school birth rate, given that it's based on the total population times 1,000. And look at uh, death rates, school death rates. It is the number of deaths per thousand of the population a year calculated as 
number of deaths from total population dying is 1,001. Now, let's go to migration. It's simply the movement of people from one place to another to live. We start with um, immigration. Immigration is the movement of people into another country. And those moving into another country are known as immigrants. While immigration is the movement of people out of their country. Those going out, they are regarded as immigrants. We have population of other resources. Autumn population, that's a population with, um, that's a population that has um, a high, a, that output per head is maximized. Population with a high output per head. Meanwhile, underpopulation is a case where there is insufficient level to make the best use of other existing resources. So underpopulation occurs below the optimum population. Then we have overpopulation that occurs after optimum. That's overpopulation that occurs after optimum. Meaning that if there's an increase in population, it reduces the average product. So it is the size of the population which provides the level force which is better than the existing resources in the economy. Now let's look at some, 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 some concepts. Growing or youthful population. That's the population with low average age. So the characteristic is usually the characteristic of uh, developing countries with high birth rate. We have aging or de uh, declining population, population of high average age. As a characteristic of developed countries because of high, uh, low death rates and low birth rates. Now let's go to uh, revision questions. We we'll start with revision questions. We we'll start with the first question. One might explain an increase. One might explain an increase in the volume of a country's imports. We have an appreciation of the country's exchange rates, an increase in the country's tariff a recession in the country, a rise in the country's rate of saving. Now, if we look through, we'll see that uh, the best option is going to be A, which is an appreciation of the country's exchange rate. So that is the answer A. Now, we'll get to, uh, to exercise two. <coughs> Given the following information, we'll have bicycles, rice, country X and Y. Then we'll have a question here. But looking at the table, we'll see that country X has an absolute advantage in bicycle and rice production. And why Y has an absolute disadvantage? Now, the question is, which of the following is true of the following of the situation above? Country Y has a competitive advantage in the production of bicycles. Country, y, country X has a competitive advantage in the production of bicycles. Country Y has a competitive advantage in the production of rice. Country Y has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods. Now, if you just go back, uh, we'll see that if we calculate the competitive advantage, let's say of country X, we have to look at one um, bicycle to produce bicycle that's sacrificing rice. So four is, is equal to four is to two hundred. It means we have to look at the opportunity cost of one uh, unit of bicycle in terms of rice. We we'll divide two hundred by four. It's going to be one is to should be plus one is to fifty. One is to fifty. Then we'll do the same thing here, 2 is to this, that means 40 divided by 2 will give us 1 is to 20. So 1 is to 50 and 1 is to 20, it means that country X is sacrificing up to 50 kilograms of rice. Country Y sacrifices only 20 kilograms of rice to produce one bicycle. So we can conclude that country Y has a compressive advantage in uh, the production of bicycles. Right answer is A. Now let's go to the next exercise. Give the following information about visible exports and all that. Which alternative is the current account balance? Now we have to get the current account balance is visible balance or invisible balance. Our visible balance here is a um, visible trade is visible export minus visible import. 560 minus 620. That's going to give us um, something like uh, minus 60. Now, as the transfer is positive, so it becomes export. We we'll add to 50 here, give all the remains with minus 10. Interest, uh, profit, and dividend is 70 here. That now gives us 60. Minus 10 from 70 is 60. Now, plus, same is 60 positive, it gives us 150. So, our right answer is uh, 150. It's well calculated. The next question 
competitive cost advantage to submit on the basis of our definition. The right answer is C. Opportunity cost. Under which of the following situation may a nation experience favorable terms of trade? We have earlier said favorable terms of trade will come either when export prices are rising or import prices are falling. So we'll look at the various alternatives: import prices fall, export prices fall, export prices fall faster, export prices fall equal. Right answer is A. Import prices are falling. Therefore, export prices are higher than import prices. Next question. Um, question is based on the figure we show country X, and this is for export and import. Now, the set, the terms of trade in year 2000 is. Now, looking at the alternative answers, and we know that terms of trade is uh, calculated by index of export prices or an index of import prices. We equally know that um, at the year 2000, when the export of index prices is less than the, in, uh, the sorry, when the export price index is less than the import price index, as we've seen here, it means it's an unfavorable situation. And among, without even calculating, among the answers here, we we'll see that the unfavorable, the one that is less than one that is only A. So A, if not, we we'll still calculate, we we'll take our 105 divided by 120 times one is going to give us 87.5. So the right answer there is uh, A. Uh, why might the 15 percent devaluation of the country's currency fail to improve its balance of trade deficit? Now, supply of the country's export is elastic. Demand of the country's import is elastic. Other co countries devalue their revalue their currencies by uh, 20 percent. Other currencies devalue their currencies by 20 percent. The correct answer here is uh, D. Because devaluation is only going to be effective when there is no um, retaliation. Um, question 8 Which of the following people will benefit because of the devaluation of the franc safety? Everything being equal. We have a Cameroonian tourist traveling to France, a French importer of Cameroon cocoa, a Cameroonian importer of German cars, a French exporter of wine to Cameroon. Uh, we look so we see that a French importer of Cameroon cocoa. Importing Cameroon cocoa means that uh, because when there is devaluation, our export now becomes cheaper. So the French person is going to benefit. So the right answer there is uh, B. Which of the following is more likely to promote economic growth? Capital consumption, a decrease in the retirement age, increased net investments, and net immigration. Here it's uh, very clear that the best answer is C. Increase net. Uh, Investment, single investment is one of those uh, determinants of economic growth. In an economy with unemployed resources, which of the following will cause an increase in output in the short run? A. The government budgeting for deficits. B. The rise in the rate of interest. C. The introduction of maximum price control. D. The government reducing investment incentives. The government, they say, in an economy with unemployed resources, which of the following will cause and increase in output in the short run. Right answer should be A, the government budgeting for a deficit. What is likely to increase the country's actual output but may reduce its long run rate of growth or potential output? Okay, we have an increase in the size of the labor force, increase in government spending on education. An increase in the size of the government body deficits, increase female participation in the labor force. We're going to get <coughs> C is a good answer because an increase in the size of government deficits uh, in the short run, that will increase up in the long run. The government might not be able to achieve a faster rate of growth, they might not be able to have money to achieve all the, the real um, capital goods that, that is needed. So the right answer there is C. Exercise 12. What, ch what change would best indicate that a country has experienced economic development, an improvement in average students' quality of life, an increase in the country's real GDP, an improvement in the country's trade balance, and appreciation in the country's currency? Uh, we did say balance of economic development has to do with improvement in living standards. So A is going to be the correct answer. A recession as a phase of the business cycle. Is characterized by an increase in investments, 
falling government expenditure on benefits, increasing inflationary pressures, increasing stocks of unsold goods. When there's a depression, we talk about a, a recession, that means uh, economic activity is slowing down. The right answer is increasing stocks of unsold goods. Demand is falling. So we go to 14. Which of the following policies tend to reduce both the rates of inflation and the balance of payment limits? So which of the following policies tend to reduce both the rate of inflation and the balance of payment deficits? We talk about a reduction in government spending, an increase in tariffs, a reduction in level of interest rates, a rise in the country's current uh, currency exchange rates. We're going to see that a reduction in government spending here is going to reduce uh, infl uh, inflation because it reduces aggregate demand. At the same time, it's going to reduce importation. So that's the correct answer A. Why might a rise in the government spending designed to reduce unemployment cause a rise in inflation rate? Its introduction coincides with an upturn in economic activities. It stimulates a rise in level of productivity. It is accompanied by the revaluation of the currency. It is introduced at a time when there is spare capacity in the economy. Its introduction coincides with an upturn in economic activities. Upturn now we talk about an expand, uh, expansion of the recovery. So A should be the correct answer. What is most likely to increase as a result of a rise in interest rates in the country? Inflow of short-term foreign capital, the level of private investment, return on capital investment, level of employment. Yeah, the short-term, inflow of short-term cap, uh, foreign capital is going to be the correct answer to benefit from the high interest rate. As a result of the fall in demand for bread, bakeries in the town are closed down and workers are thrown out of their jobs. Which type of unemployment are associated to this? That's already all that represents uh, structural unemployment. We're already we're defining the various types. The right answer is uh, B. Which of the following factors is likely to cause an increase in the bread rates in the country? Bad rates, look at contraceptive being freely supplies, increased living standards, more education, early marriages. Early marriages should be the best option. Question 17 is based, sorry, sorry supposed to be 19, is based on the following statistics on the population of a given country. We have the total population that is given. We have infants, deaths, age less than one year, is given as 5,000, births 400,000. Why is the dependency? Uh, ratio for this population. Now, to calculate the dependency ratio, we could simply just we take the uh, independent population, or the dependent population is to the independent population, or the inactive population to the active population. The non working age group represents the inactive population. If there are 12 million and the population is uh, 20 million, it means that the workers, the active population is 8 million. So that means we are taking 12 million is 8 million. 12 is to 8, we'll bring it down, we're going to have 3 is to 2, which gives us a B as an answer. Now, question, the next question is based on the same uh, table. They ask for the infant mortality rate, and it's calculated as um, the number of children who died before their first birthday, that's less than one year, 5,000 divided by the number of births, 400,000 times 1,000 on one. If you do the calculation, we'll get 12.5 per thousand, the answer is in per thousand. Now we have which of the following factors is likely to cause an increase in the death rate in the country? Increase in the death rate, this one is clear. Occurrence of natural disasters is uh, the best answer. What is most likely to be increased by a policy of increased direct taxes and lower government spending? Now, from all this, balance of payment deficit, budget deficit, rate of inflation, the level of unemployment is likely to be increased. So the right answer there is uh, team. Which of the following is least likely to be the government policy objective? We had full employment, economic stability, uh, balanced budget, economic growth. The government must not go up with balanced budget with this surplus. So the best option is uh, C. The thing between a devaluation and a depreciation of the currency, uh, that's an A part of the question. To what extent can devaluation successfully eliminate deficits in the balance of payment? The next, let's get the, the, the answer guide. Devaluation is defined as a deliberate reduction in the exchange rate of the currency under the fixed exchange rate. 
While depreciation of the currency is a fall in the value of the currency in terms of others under the floating exchange rate. Now, we expect students uh, should explain how devaluation can correct the debt CPOP. That is, the should be that when there's devaluation, it makes export cheaper, thereby promoting exportation, bringing in more income, and reducing expenditure on imports because it makes imports expensive. Now, the source of devaluation depends on the following factors, which we saw already. The demand of export must be elastic, imports must also be elastic, the supply of export must be elastic, should be elastic, that is, the country have some spare capacity. The equality should be no retaliation. Now, what constitutes the current accounts on the balance of payments? And uh, the B part, how many favorable terms of trades improve upon the country balance of payment situation? Okay, let's look at the first. The student will expect to lose the guide, already had that in the notes. They are expected to give a meaning of balance of payment and current accounts, define the two, give the meaning. Still, and explain the components of the current accounts, the examples, of course, you know that they are visible and invisible uh, trade balances. Show that visible trade balance or visible trade balance is going to give you the current account. That's what the student will be expected to do. For the B part, the student should give the meaning of the favorable terms of trade, that is, when a smaller quantity of exports exchanges the larger quantity of imports. Or better still, if um, export prices are rising faster than import prices, we could show the formula to show that it's, when it's greater than 100, this favorable, that's index of export prices, type of index of import prices, and it's on one. When it's greater than 100, it is favorable because the 100 is the base here. Show that the favorable terms of trade will improve upon the balance of payment situation when exports and imports are both in a lasting demand. When exports and imports are both in a lasting demand, we know that when the terms of trade is favorable, it means that export prices are rising. And the export prices are rising when um, the demand for uh, our export is in elastic. That means we're going to make more revenue from exports, even that the quantity demand will not fall significantly. That's going to that's why the federal term control will improve upon the balance of payments which are only when the demand for imports and exports are in elastic. Now let's get to the last exercise. The table below shows the indices of exports and import prices for the 10-year period for a primary economy. You have year 1 to 10. Now we have the various years. You are expected to calculate the terms of trade and briefly comment. So these are the terms of trade here. Of course, a formula that uh, we have seen, uh, the index of export prices divided by index of import prices and it's 101. So if we employ that formula, we are going to have uh, this table. Now looking at this table, we'll see that the terms of trade, because the next, uh, the question said, um, calculate the terms of trade and briefly explain, but it's an explanation that we need to give. Now look at the terms of trade, we'll see that between year one and two, it is less than 100. You have 95.83, 96.9 between year one and two. What does it mean? It means that the terms of trade within these two years is unfavorable, given that the value is less than 100. Now, if you look at the terms of trade between year three right up to 10, you see that it's strictly greater than 100, showing that the terms of trade is favorable within this range. So that could be the comment. Now, this is, uh, we'll finally come to the end of this revision uh, lesson. We'll meet again another time. Una tege si, ma tege yob. Una tege minga, ma tege nyum. Una tege majang, ma tege ndom. Mane tambia niña ne injubia yen. Ngani bana, ma tege mot. Ngani la kiri, wa tege ndong. Esa kina, bia jinkido. Mane tambia niña ne injubia yen. Tam tama mote, tam zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia niña ne injubiayen